what do we have on the bench today? This is an IMSI 8080, which we have disassembled or partially disassembled uh, for a shoot of an intro that we did for another video series that we're doing called Behind the Front Panel. So since we had it completely apart, we thought it might be a nice to let everybody see a little bit of the experience that was putting this machine together originally in the 1970s when it first came out. So where do you begin with something like this? I mean, this is, is this, is this what it looked like when you first got it? Oh, heavens no. This is uh, what it looked like after about the first uh, two thirds or three quarters of the work was done. <laughs> um, the machine as it initially came, um, essentially came with a processor board, a RAM board, the front panel board, Essentially all is bare boards, no components on them at all, no chips, no sockets, no anything, and reams and reams of parts. Um, all of these switches in a bag, all of these chips on static foam, all of these LEDs and other components in bags, and you spend a considerable amount of your initial time setting this machine up um, on the workbench soldering these things together. So this, you had to solder, or you would have to solder every single one of these components on there. Yeah, absolutely. It came as a completely bare board. Um, it was up to you whether you wanted to put sockets on or not. Um, I always put sockets on everything because back in those days, I tended to be a rather klutzy solderer. And if I didn't use sockets, I tended to burn up a lot of ICs. Mm, sounds like <laughs> my soldering. Yeah, um, but you can see these ones, you kind of get a feel for... You know, imagine that completely bare and full of holes, and now you've got to figure out what components go where, put them in place. Sounds like fun. Oh, yeah. yeah. And I don't assume the power supply, the giant freaking can power supply here, would be much the same? Yeah. Um, I'm not actually sure from the instruction manual, which I did pull up to take a look at, whether the power supply board itself came pre-assembled or whether it also came as a board with the original cans and and transformer separate um, whether this was put together at the factory um, same thing for the expansion board um, not quite sure i'm guessing from the variations in the sockets and so forth that this probably also came naked as a board and you soldered the s100 connectors onto it um, so where we're starting today is, as I said, uh, with a lot of the work already done, the expansion board or the bus board is already installed, the power supply is already installed, and the boards are already built. So all we're really going to be doing is final assembly of the chassis, installation of the boards, and some testing. Wow. All right. So where does one, I guess, go from here? I mean, if you're what, two hours into the build of this thing? Oh, you're 20 hours into the build of this 20 thing. 20 hours into the build of this thing. <laughs> uh, if, you're, if you're the typical hobbyist, yeah. You're, you're uh, several days into the build of this thing before you're at this point. In mock terms, where we're starting in the instructions is the point at which we have assembled the base chassis, the motherboard, the power supply, and we've put the back piece on. And we're at the point now where we're going to put the front support piece on, the front panel itself, and then the remainder of the front panel and the card supports that hold all of the cards in place. Mm. So we're following pretty much the instructions more or less in the order that they are in the original 1976 user's manual. We are just picking up... Uh, as I said, pretty far into the process. So, um, as you can see, our front panel was already pre-wired. Wiring in, uh, there was not an, a requirement to put a disconnect between the front panel and the machine itself. So, in this particular case, this machine was assembled by somebody who chose not to put any kind of a front panel disconnect in. So, the front panel is now soldered in, and in order to remove it, I would have to unsolder the wires on this side and that is the original owner's solder not mine so with the front panel support in place we're now ready to mount the front panel to it and that is done with a series of plastic spacers and screws a short spacer a long spacer 
and a screw. And there are just simply repetitive sets of long spacers, short spacers, and screws. Okay, so to assemble the front panel, we're gonna start with the front panel. This is the front panel. It actually consists of a couple of pieces. It's a paper backed transparent overlay against red with clear. Pretty sophisticated. Mm -hmm. So all those pieces, at least for the front panel. <laughs> and then to attach the front panel to the actual front panel board, we'll use the spacers and screws. The best way to do this is to assemble the board like this, putting the screws in first. Once all the screws are in place, we're going to put the spacers in. The tall spacers go in between the front panel and the board itself because they hold the board back far enough to leave room for the LEDs. Okay, so once we have the screws and the spacers in the front panel, we're going to set the front panel down quickly on the desk so that the desk can hold the screws in place. And then we're going to bring the front panel over and we're going to put the front panel down on top of the screws, which conveniently line up with holes in the board. And there we go. Now we're in the board. Now we have the short spacers, which hold the front panel away from this so that none of this electrical shorts against any of that metal. Okay, before we can install the front panel, we have one final piece of the chassis that we have to install here. We have to install the card guides, which hold the cards in place when they're plugged into the back plane here. Uh, the card guides came from the factory essentially as these stamped bent pieces of metal with holes drilled in them, uh, two of them, and a bag with 44 of these plastic edge card guides here, which you then had to snap into place using the holes and friction fits on the guides. Yeah. And it's significantly easier than what I thought it was going to be. I thought you were going to glue it into place and have to space them. Yeah, no, that's they. they there's more than enough work to to do on this without having to add that to it. So uh, we make sure and get the orientation correct. You'll notice that the slides themselves are flat on one side, but they're open, more open on the other side. That's the side that's intended, obviously, to accept the card from the top. That makes it easier to get the card into the slot. So we have to make sure and mount them with that side up. And in this particular case, because this has already been assembled, the sticker has also already been put on by the user uh, to warn of the dangers of high voltage in the power supply. And uh, that with this uh, power supply right here is a linear power supply. It is not a switcher. So it does not actually have any step up transformers or anything like that. The high voltage that they're referring to here is simply the fact that the naked 110 volts basically runs around on open traces on here. So you can get yourself a regular wall, wall shock. Uh, but it's not like a switcher where you can uh, literally kill yourself on thousands of volts. Okay. Before I tighten these down, I'm going to put a board in the front and back to use it as a spacer. So I'm going to mount the MPU board up in one of the front slots. And I'm going to mount the RAM board in one of the back slots is one of the things about the S100 bus. I could technically leave them there the whole time. The uh, S100 bus is parallel. Every one of these connectors is identical. I can put any card into any slot. Uh, in fact, I could, if I really wanted to, put the front panel in the back. I'm now ready to remount the front panel. I'm going to carefully bring this up. and I'm going to set it in place. And I'm going to juggle plugging this in with trying not to knock these screws out. So I'm actually plugging this front panel into the first motherboard connector, which sticks out in front of that support that we mounted earlier. And I'm getting that weaseled into place. 
which I just did, and foul number one. Now that the front panel's in place, I can tuck the power wiring out of the way, and I can remount the remainder of the front panel. This is the little front support piece. Makes it look aesthetically pretty. And we have a reassembled IMSI 8080. For the remainder of the hookup, we need to take the front panel interconnect cable, which is a ribbon cable with a 16 pin dip header on the end of it. And that plugs into a socket on the MPU board. And that actually provides a couple of bi-directional data signals to the front panel that are actually not available on the S100 bus and it's part of what makes it possible for the front panel to communicate directly with the memory and with the processor uh, and control it in the way that it does. So that's it? That's all that goes into building an MSI? Well, that's pretty much it, yes. Once you've taken all the hours and soldered all the boards and turned all the screws and plugged everything in, you've got yourself a bare bones IMSI system. No, bare bones. Right. You've got a CPU, you've got memory. You've got nothing else. You've got no peripherals, you've got no input-output, you've got no ability to communicate with any other device. Um, you've got no storage of any kind, disk drive, tape drive, anything like that. You've got a CPU and you've got RAM. So this thing had the ability to do significantly more than just make the front panel flash. Oh yes, yes, but uh, obviously that requires more boards than what's in it right now. What we're going to do to test this is we're going to demonstrate the actual bare bones functionality of this machine by using the front panel to show what the raw processor and memory actually do in conjunction with the front panel. Um, but uh, that's only the starting point of the machine. Um, the real power of the machine is the fact that once you do add some peripherals to this, disk drive, uh, monitor, you know, serial port and a monitor, uh, a terminal, you would actually have a machine that uh, speed for speed instruction wise was fairly comparable to a uh, similar period 1970s early IBM mainframe. Wow. On your desktop. And a lot of people did some very cool things with this. All right, so before we put the case on, I have a tendency to want to power up and test my machines simply because I have a history of powering up and testing machines that I just put the case back on uh, afterwards and finding out that I forgot to plug a cable in somewhere inside. We are going to turn this beast on and hope for the best. Okay, so far so good. What we're seeing is pretty much random and that's because the machine boots up in a pretty much random state. So what we are going to do to clear it is hit reset. Okay, something is wrong. The seven light should not be flickering. Now you see why we didn't put the case on. <laughs> Start out by putting the memory back where the memory was. Let's see whether that makes any difference. Make sure that the cards are seated correctly. Yes. Solidly, I should say. Not correctly, because they are seated correctly. Yeah, they are correct, but they're solid. The uh, indication with a flaky data bus byte is this ribbon cable having not been seated properly. normally. Okay, so we hit reset now. Yeah, seven is intermittent, so we have already failed the first test. Okay, so the lesson there is watch very carefully when you tighten that front panel down if you don't have all the spacers because the whole point of those spacers was to keep those legs on the back of the front panel from accidentally touching the metal support behind it. And what we were doing was shorting to the metal support behind it. 
Okay, so now we're ready to run the first test program. We've passed the first test, which we hit reset. When we hit reset, everything lights. That's what's supposed to happen. That's test number one. It worked. All right, so what would be test number two? Well, test number two comes right out of the IMSI instruction manual, and it is test program number one. And test program number one is a program we'll key in from the front panel and it is all it's designed to do is when it's running it will watch these eight switches right here on the front panel and it will cause these eight lights to follow along with these switches so that as I change these switches these lights will follow along. Sounds kind of simple but when all you've got is lights and switches you're pretty much going to have a program that's going to do something with well lights and switches. So a little quick background in uh, IMSI programming. Um, IMSI, the CPU in this machine is an 8080 processor. What you're seeing right here is an example of some 8080 machine code instructions. So this is the actual code that the uh, processor itself runs at the native level. Um, getting into an explanation of how the 8080 actually works and what it does is uh, for another video for sure. Uh, in this case what we're going to do is we're going to follow the program. You can see here it's got an address, an instruction, the actual instruction and it's showing it in hex binary and octal. That's really all the same thing. Hex DB is binary 1101 1011 is octal 333 they're the same thing uh, they show them in those three uh, different ways because different programmers who came up from different backgrounds tend to think in different ways octal was used very heavily in the mainframe environment so a lot of programmers think in octal if they came from that environment um, if you've done a lot of work in microcomputers you tend to think in hex or or binary more more so uh, at least the computers I've, I've worked on uh, binary corresponds to the actual switches. So when we say 11011011, that actually means 11011011. And that's the first instruction at address 0. And so what we're going to do, since we've now put that into the switches, is we're going to put that into address 0. And in order to get to address 0, the first thing that I have to do is put all zeros in for the address and then hit examine. Examine causes it to read these switches and then go to that address. And you can see the address, none of the address lights are lit. That's because we are now at address 0. So now we're going to put in that instruction 11011011 and then we're going to hit deposit. And deposit is going to deposit it at address 0 because that's where we're at. So we just deposited that. And now you can see on the data bus, that's actually what is at address zero, is that data right there. Now we're going to put in the next instruction, which is 11111111. And the way we're going to put the next instruction in is hit by hitting the button deposit next. And what you'll see happen there is that the address bus now changed. That's now a one. Okay, zero 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 one. And that means we're at address 1, and address 1 now contains FF. Final instruction, another 0, address 6. All right, so now that you have this programmed with a, well, relatively simple yet seemingly complex program, <laughs> what do you do to run it? Okay, well, first off, I'm going to set all the switches back to 0, and I'm going to go back and hit examine again. That resets my address to zero. You can see that six was what was in here. It's gone now. It's all zeros again. And you can now see that it's re-showing me again that 1101 that's in that memory. If I wanted to, I can look at the program by using the examine next button. So each time I hit that, the address is going to increment and I can see back what I actually put in there. So 11111111 was my next instruction. 11010011 was my next instruction and so on and so forth. So I can play the program back and actually see all six bytes of the instruction. Gonna you hit can actually use that to go back and uh, fix any, uh, I guess, typos? Correct. As it would be in the program? Yeah, I wonder what the binary word for a switch-o. 
uh, yeah, you could fix any switch O's that you make in there by going back to that address and simply redepositing in that address the correct value. Hmm. So I'm going to go back to all zeros and hit examine again so that I'm, my address is now at zero. But instead of using the examine button, this time I'm going to hit the run button. And what that's going to do is tell it to start running the program that's at address zero. And that program is now running. And what's happening is that you can see the address bus is flashing like crazy. That's because the processor is constantly cycling through the instructions. Uh, the data bus is cycling like crazy because it's, show, you know, you're, it's cycling faster than you can see. And now in this case, what we're seeing is the LEDs and the switches. And if the program is actually working, flipping a switch should cause the corresponding LED to go off. And it does. So you can actually see that the program is running because the lights are following the switches. That's the very simplest example of industrial automation. A computer watching for input and controlling an output as the result of the input. That is Computer Automation 101. The simplest automation program you could have. And that's a very good way to test every bit of the MZI 8080 that it can receive input, it can process input, and it can produce output. Absolutely, yeah. That this is this is really testing the front panel, it's testing the processor, it's testing at least six bytes of the RAM. Now there could be bad RAM and memory above six and we wouldn't necessarily know that. Uh, but it's fairly easy to toggle in another front panel program, a little bit longer than the one that we put in right here, um, that will simply read and write every byte of memory in the machine and examine it and test it. So you can write a self-test program. I believe that's later on in the instructions. All right, well, on that note, we have assembled a running IMSI 8080 bare bones system. In future episodes of On the Workbench, we'll probably upgrade this to include a uh, floppy disk controller and a floppy drive and see if we can't get some CPM booted up on this. <laughs>